Let's go. This is one of the most serious chapters against the lines in the third move, knight f3 against the tango. So after they play knight f3 and you play e6, uh, we have to check what happens if white simply goes with knight on c3. I just have to tell you something that if you play d5, you just play like a bad version of Queen's Gambit Orthodox with a knight on c6. If you play anything else, it is going to be uh, pretty much uh, condemned on failure here. And basically, that's why you just have to go with the bishop before. And what is this? This is typical nims. And white has lots of options. Actually, I got a good news for you. I actually played this variation, I believe, uh, in my practice, seven tournament games. And after bishop before, literally everyone played queen c2. And by the way, uh, just for you to show you what kind of line I'm, I'm showing you right now, just to know that there is a Nimzo line with d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop before, queen c2. It's called Kasparov's line because Gary Kasparov, it was Kasparov's favorite line with the white pieces. They don't want to break the structure and they want to th uh, take it with a healthy queen takes c3 and then there is a line with knight c6 ever since then actually i included this line knight c6 into my opening repertoire against those who play queen c2 in Nimzo. and just like i told you seven tournament games uh four wins and three draws don't forget mostly those were like gms so results are pretty good what's my plan to play d6 and fast e5 but about it, about uh, actually uh, this from different order moves. D4, knight f6, c4, knight c6, and after knight f3 to stop e5, we go with e6. And when they go and play knight, uh, knight c3, sorry, uh, you just go with bishop b4. Uh, of all the moves, queen c2, uh, e3, and bishop d2, I believe that. Queen C2 is just the most serious approach. Let's take a look what happens if they just go bishop d2. It's a stupid move. And uh, I have to say that I played once a very suspicious game against Grandmaster Toshic. I played d6 and he reacted in a good fashion against me. He played d5. He, he's not threatening to, when I move the knight, to play queen a4 and to win the bishop. So I took on c3, he had to, uh, played knight b8. And when he played d takes e6, I captured back by bishop. When he played like e3, uh, sorry, when he played knight e4, I played bishop d7, and he offered me a draw. And this is where we drew the game. I just have to tell you, this is absolutely safely better game for white. Uh, because of the bishop here, because of more of space in the center. Uh, but I don't know why did he offer me a draw, probably because I killed him six times before that. Uh, after bishop d2, I just checked these variations and check how Grandmaster Miladinovic, ex-world junior champion, strong 2600 player, used to play this. Uh, he goes with d5. There are guys who against bishop d2 go with castles. And after a3, of course, they take capture by bishop. Then you go with d6, they play queen e7, and they're pretty much obsessed with pushing e5. And that's a normal game. It's a legal a Bogo Indian plan, you give up your bishop for the knight, and afterwards you just pretty much put all your focuses on breaking with e5. But that didn't happen in the Miladinovic game. In Miladinovic game, he played d5. And this is quite an interesting type of Nimzo Indian, where you play d5, and where you actually want to uh, provoke them to play e3. They have to, what else? And you go castles, of course. And now you wait for them to waste Tempe. If they play a3, you just have to put your bishop back on d6. But if they go with bishop on d3, uh, then you, what do you do? Uh, you, you still wait. You still wait for a3. You still wait for a3. And when they go castles, you can't wait any longer because you did all kind of useful moves. By the way, what would happen if that a3 happens? You first take on c4. 
you earn Tempi. I already told you this once. Then you bring your bishop back. Now it's even better that you have a6 being done because now you want to break in the center with e5. And then you get a good game because as soon as they play d5, you play knight e7, put your knight on g6 and go with a more or less typical king in uh, king side attack. After castles, you just have to take, bring your bishop back, and you're getting ready for e5. In a game, Istratesco Miladinovic, two very strong uh, GMs, Istratesco played h3. It's a reasonable move because once we play and push e5, uh, they just want to have bishop g4 prevented. And after h3, e5, d takes, knight takes, knight takes, bishop takes. Isfratesco in the game played a4 and offered the draw to Miladinovic. Makes sense. It stops b5 for black and gives, uh, gives quite a, an interesting play to both of these sides. I believe that your plan could be c6 followed by bishop c7 and queen e7, queen e5, or queen d6. Rook goes on e8, bishop on f5, possibly. But position itself is very unclear, I would say, with mutual chances. So, all things considered, if your opponent plays bishop d2, just like I experienced in my game, I suggest you not to go with uh, d6, not to go with castle, but to go with d5. It's a nice move, and uh, I didn't, uh, just like that, put the yellow color on both of these pieces. My point was, if I have a pretty weird knight on c6, you have a pretty weird bishop on d2. Uh, if you want to take advantage of that bishop with playing some, I don't know, a3, uh, then, of course, here I can, I can take on c3 and take on c4, and even afterwards defend it with b5. Uh, but the point is, uh, when they play a3, I just go castles. If they go a3 here, you just have to, you know what? You can't wait any longer. You just have to bring it back to d6 and hope for d takes c4 followed by e5 with the break in the center. That's what I explained to you with bishop d3. a6, you do this clever move. As soon as they play bishop, you just do this... Uh, uh, a6, you, you wait for them to play a3. As soon as you see a3, you just, if you remember, take on c4 and bring the bishop back to d6 and break with e5. I explained the ideas there. I just want to show a game of uh, mine that played against Grandmaster uh, Dražić. We played like this. He played d5, knight e7. He played e4. I was very happy that it actually happened. I played knight e6. Now take a look at this a6. They can't even play knight b5. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, when the guy played rook c1 or first b4, uh, I played a very interesting move, knight h5. Uh, by the way, knight e5 doesn't work because knight e5, queen h5, knight takes e4. So, so I'm showing you this line. Looks like knight is hanging, but don't worry. Actually, bishop is hanging as well. And this is how we win a piece. So knight h5 is a nice move where I actually launch the attack. Uh, all of a sudden, my opponent got, got into severe troubles, and eventually I managed to win the game in a razor attack on the king side. What's my plan here? My plan is to either go with queen f6 and knight f4, or this knight, or bishop g4, or at some point even f5, breaking on the king side uh, when opening the f file. All these variations look good for black, and black just has a very, very nice action on the king side. Apart from bishop d2, uh, they can also play e3. Uh, that actually transposes into Rubenstein variation of Nibzo. And you don't have to be worried about this Rubenstein variation of Nibzo. I'll show you the game uh, played by Polygon and his system here. Basically, uh, it is not going to uh, differentiate too much uh, with the variations that I already showed you. So when they play like a3, you should be going with castles. Uh, when they play bishop d3, you play d5. Unlike previous lesson position, uh, you just have to uh, hear bishop on d3 instead of queen on c2. Ideas are pretty much the same. We committed ourselves with this knight on c6. By the way, if you're unhappy with this idea, 
when they play a3 to take on c4, bring the bishop back on d6 and play e5. If you're happy with this, I'm reminding you, you can play like Bolagan did. He played d6, captured on c3, and he actually uh, very much liked the fact that he was actually fighting against this um, broken pawn structure. So after e5, he was threatening e4, and after knight e2, he just goes with rook e8, wants to go with e4, bishop f5, and to organize attack on the king side, e4, bishop f5, h5, and so on. But actually, this guy played f3, and now he played b6 to destabilize uh, this pawn structure and to kind of lock it and, uh, uh, you know, block it with c5 at some point. But actually, then he played knight e7 and played knight g6. You remember that I showed you this game at some point, uh, I believe in the first uh, part of this variation. And finally, if they play like e3, castles, bishop d3, d5, don't forget, if they play a3, you just take on c4 and play bishop d6. If they play castles, you play carefully, very, uh, I'd say, a useful move a6, because it stops knight b5. And after they go with a3, you just take on c4. I believe by now you should have learned this. You just always take on c4 first and then go with the bishop back on d6. Then you break with e5. And I already showed you the plans and kind of attack on the king side we want to go for. And finally, if in this variation they play queen c2, this is going to be a big project here because they just go with queen c2 and play Nimzo in there. They play Kasparov's line with queen c2, I already explained to you, and we go with d6. Not everybody uh, goes with this move d6, and especially not everybody goes with the next move, and it's e5. People usually play something else. Uh, I have really good experience with this position, played it more than uh, five tournament games and that actually brought me a certain dose of confidence uh, especially uh, considering the fact that most of these games I managed to win fairly easy um, in a game Fleer, uh, Glenn Fleer against Bolagan, this guy played bishop g5 uh, I explained to somebody if they play bishop g5 it's good to do that first and then to bring it back to d2 uh, this guy a couple of games uh, I played against bishop h4, then you just play g5, g4, and win the d4 pawn. That's an easy trick. If they play bishop d2, we do not have time for wasting. We break with e5. That's why we played early d6. And please watch out on this one, because when they play d5, uh, alarm, alarm, and alarm again. Uh, so they're threatening to, if you move the knight, to play queen a4 and win the piece on b4. So please don't forget and don't fall for this trick. Otherwise, switch this game with bowling. So basically, you just go and take on c3 first, and then you bring your knight back. Please don't forget, if you bring your knight here, queen a4, and you just lost the bishop and lost the game, and then I believe you should uh, um, commit suicide. So basically, you play bishop c3, bishop c3, knight e7, and they go with e4. Um, I don't want to... Uh, you know, like bother you too much with these positions. Uh, Bologan played very nice plan for Black here. Uh, you thank you so much for uh, your comment that I'm actually talking about the bishop pair most of the time, but that, that I'm actually doing great with the knights. But here, we really are uh, are supposed to do great with the knights. Uh, take a look at this position and tell me what would be your plan. So I'm not asking you for a move. I'm asking you for a plan. And if you took like enough time, and if you try to find what are you supposed to do, I believe that you should be very satisfied if you found the knight h5 plan. Because it stops bishop d3 because of knight f4. It stops bishop e2 because of the same reasons. Uh, it kind of provokes them to play g3 to limit this knight. But it opens up our knight on e7, and even better, bishop on f5. It also opens up a file for our actions. He takes, he takes bishop d3. We take play castles. And when they play queen e2, uh, queen e8. Very nice plan by Bologna. Wants to defend the knight on h5 
measure of precaution. Wants to put the queen on f7 to go after uh, the knight on uh, f3. Wants to break the center with c6, with b5. Like uh, such a big number of possibilities for black. Blanfleur played long castle and Bologan decided to break with b5. I actually analyzed this afterwards and I was wondering why Glenflair played knight d2. In case of c takes rook b8, wants to get a pawn back and eventually d5 would be also weak. He went with a, actually should go with a4 and then you suck another pawn. And the problem is they can't take because of queen takes a4 and black, uh, white is collapsing. So after like knight d2, b takes, knight comes to e4, rook b8 and rook h to f1. Looks like, and it really looks like, uh, that uh, Y just stopped for almost forever a uh, black queenside attack. But he played knight f6, whopping off uh, knights in position that is blocked. It's an amazing decision because that's what you have to do as well, because you just swap off knights and you just remain uh, with the better knight against worse bishop. After queen c4, queen b5. It's nice to swap off these queens and to take on d5. Queen e4, queen c5 threatening on f2, f4, rook f7. And here, uh, they can take on e5 e5 because you take and play knight e5 and black is white is collapsing again. So after rook f3, Bologan played rook b to f8, took on f4. Uh, played knight f5 and look at this monster on f5 even though this bishop looks good knight looks way better first of all it blocks these broken pawns secondly knight is better in a position with a broken and weaker pawn structure and finally he defends this uh, potentially weak square on the g5 so after king b1 rook e7 uh, queen c4 knight h4 this guy went with his tactics and basically he completely forgot that after rookie one, queen was hanging. He couldn't touch this queen, and he actually resigned the game. Uh, this was nice tactics in the end of the game, and just like you see, uh, top uh, counter tactical move rookie one by black. But actually, it shows you how important it is to go with the tactics in your games. In most of my games, when I play like d6 after knight f3. So queen c2, d6. Uh, people play uh, straight away bishop d2. I immediately go with e5. Uh, because when they go with bishop d2, white just prepares e4 or a3. And he's ready to mid bishop c3 with the bishop c3. Uh, then we go with uh, e5. Uh, don't forget, I'm uh, one of those who really enjoyed this move. And now I'll show you a game of mine against international master Ponovic. He played a3. Uh, I captured, played queen e Here, I was actually thinking for 45 minutes in the game because I knew that I want to provoke white to play d5 and bring my knight back to e7 and bring it to g6 onto the king side. And I was pretty much aware of the fact that the e5 uh, pawn was hanging. And I was thinking and thinking and eventually I figured out the plan after 45 minutes. I played queen e7. And after d5, I played knight d8. And after e4, I played castle. And after bishop e2, actually everything on what I actually based my game here was knight e8. So I uh, brought both of these knights back in order to push f5. That's what I did. It He played f3. And then I played an amazing move, a5. I remember that during the game, I was very happy with all these ideas because... I figured out that I should play a4, completely uh, fixing this pawn structure. I'm very happy when I play a4. Then I played b6, played bishop f5, brought my knight to f6, captured by what? By bishop, because here knight is better. And played knight takes e4 and left myself in a game like this with an amazing knight against terrible bishop. Uh, I really played... Uh, top class game here. Unfortunately, I failed to win it. Actually, we read the game eventually. Uh, I actually, I was at some point even lost. Uh, but of course, positionally, I'm almost winning here. 
So that's what you have to remember about this variation. Uh, if you're interested in this game, I played it almost fantastic, like uh, next couple of moves and missed a winning combination and actually failed to win the game. Uh, so after bishop d2, e5, hey master, that happens if a3, you just take and play that queen e7 followed by knight e8. <coughs> but what happens if they play d5? Do I have to ask you what would you do here? Uh, of course, you should take on c3 by bishop. Otherwise, if you move the knight, please shoot yourself. You just blunder the bishop on b4. So after bishop c3, bishop c3, knight e7, and they go with uh, e4. They have to go with e4. Somebody asked me, what if e3? Nothing. Then we solve the problem of the light square bishop. The more I exchange, the easier game I'm going to have here. Unlike other positions that I usually analyze, pair of knights uh, dominates uh, bishop and uh, knight, especially this uh, bad bishop on c3. So after queen d1 castles, I played a blitz game like this, and I was pretty much aware of the fact that with this move I was breaking the pawn structure and got a nice game. So after bishop c3, uh, bishop c3, knight e7, e4. And uh, after castles, they go knight d2. Uh, I have like a big number of games played by uh, one of the best defenders of all times, Petrosian. Uh, I played a game myself against Serbian uh, champion Sadlak. So I have to show you some games. For example, bishop e2. Looks logical. Uh, of course, that practice has seen other moves, but neither of them promises quite any advantage. You just go knight g6 to, stop, to jump on f4 g3 and now you can play bishop h3 to block the light squares you can play a5 fighting on the queen side uh, you know just like some positional approach and this guy played h6 plan was to be able to go with the bishop on h3 without possibility by white to play knight g5 that's why the guy played knight e2 and now bishop h3 and after long castles he now decided to break on the queen side with c6 after f3, rook c8, king b1, c takes, c takes, played knight d7. This knight naturally goes on c5, knight e3, and bishop brings back on uh, here. Why? Because you're happy to go with b5 and b4 afterwards. This guy played queen d2, uh, and after knight e7, which is a nice move because he tries to play f5. And this guy probably was very happy to go with g4 to stop f5, and now he did the beautiful move knight g6 because he's just created a weakness on f4 and uh, did an amazing positional uh, move. Uh, after knight g2, what happened in the game? Uh, Papayano played knight h4, queen h4, queen h3, and played b6. And unlike most of positions that we analyzed together, here Papayano uh, fighting against the bishop pair was very nice uh, and actually got a better position against Mujdalishvili. Those are both guys around 2650, strong players. And in case of H4, what are you going to do? Well, try to trade the light square bishops off and try to actually deprive your opponent of the bishop heir. So played queen e8 followed by bishop e5. And that's what happened. Uh, there is also a possibility if they don't play with this move to go with a move like g3. It's interesting move because it more or less tells you, hey man, don't, don't dare to play knight h5 because your knight cannot come on uh, f4 uh, till the rest of the game. But then you go with the knight back on e8 and break uh, in a typical uh, fashion with f5. After he takes, bishop takes. I really believe that after bishop e4, knight f6, knight g6, uh, black had more than a nice game. Uh, who was black, Diman Drakin, one of the best players in the world. He was black in this game, and I very much enjoy his game uh, here. Then uh, I saw some players who played bishop d3. Uh, bishop d3 uh, can all, I mean, knight h5 can always be parried out with g3. So this guy played a5. Uh, clever move. If you want to go with short castle, I'll play knight g6, move my knight from f6, and break with f5 somehow. Or maybe I'm not going to move my knight to g6 if I want to make sure that I can play f5 anyhow. And in the game was a5. Like, if you want to play the long castle, what happened in the game? 
Now knight d7, this knight naturally goes on c5, and then you break on the queen side with c6. Knight d2, c6, knight c5, and broke with f5. A black was really fine because uh, he managed to create some counterplay on the queen side. He did break the pawn chain with c6, but also did a break with f5 as well. Finally, if they play long castles, don't even hesitate. You now know the plans. You play knight h5. They go g3 to prevent knight f4. No big deal, baby. I break with f5. You go knight e2. I take. I'm bringing my bishop to f5. Go with my queen to g6. Play knight f6, challenging your pieces, and play queen g6. This is how Wolfgang Unziker, famous GM from Germany, that was played in uh, mid like 50s, played a game like this, and this was like really, really nice. And finally, in case of bishop c3, bishop c3, 97, e4, castles, in case they play 92, in my opinion, that's the most flexible move. Uh, I'll show you a game of mine. I played against uh, ex-Serbian player, 2600 guy, uh, Nikola Sedlak. I played bishop d7 because 92 was so flexible that I actually realized that I have to be uh, like flexible as well and not to show him. Am I going to go with a clearly kingside action with knight h5 and f5 or I may be going to break him with c6? So I did this bishop d7 move and then he played bishop e2. I said, okay, it's time for my action. I was threatening knight f4. He told me that uh, he thought that this knight g6 doesn't work because of h4. I jumped on f4. He brought the bishop back and he said, and I thought that I was great. And I completely forgot that you can play knight g4, what I actually did. And when he played g3, I did this fantastic maneuver with my knights. And I made sure to move my knights from the f file to break with f5. And I gotta tell you something very disappointing here, just because in the first round of the Serbian championship round robin, I lost the game. Unfortunately, I lost and I was completely winning. I was a little bit coward and I wanted to calm down the tournament. And I said, I'm offering my opponent to draw. He uh, was very happy to make a draw uh, offer at this point, even though he's 2600 player. Uh, because he told me, well, Maya, your plan was kind of obvious. I can't play f3 because knight e3. You want to play f5. Uh, and uh, really, we analyzed the game afterwards, and we both agreed that this was a great game for me. After knight h5, bishop d3, knight f4, castles, and f5. I'm showing a game between Hartman and Shapovalov played in Indianapolis 2016. This guy played c5. Shapovalov played knight g6. He takes two on d3. Uh, queen d3 played knight f4, captured by bishop, and Shabalov used this trick against this poor guy and killed him in a typical uh, fashion for the tango opening. All things considered, uh, I actually believe that after uh, d5, uh, bishop c3, bishop c3, knight e7, we should be more than satisfied with existing position. And that's why. Uh, players like to go with a3 move. And that's going to be the last move we're going to check tonight. Uh, you take on c3, and after queen c3, we go with a5. I do not only stop b4, but I'm also threatening a4 to fix your opponent b2. I believe by now you should have re learned this one. And after b3, uh, to stop a4, very nice move h6, to limit bishop on c1. Now the bishop is limited and it goes on b2. After g3, castles, bishop g2, I gotta show you a game of mine. Uh, here I found a game between Alterman and Koshashvili. And this is how I actually learned about this opening. Uh, Alterman played queen e7, rook e8 to break with e5 at all costs, and he did it like this. Problem with the queen on e7 is uh, no more knight e7, knight g6. So you got to be very, very careful. You first play rook e8, and you want to break with e5. When they play castles, you play e5. I played against Jovanovic. I am from Serbia. He took on e5, played bishop e2, where I played bishop g4. I actually learned about this system from Nakamura's game against Kashishvili. Uh, plan with the bishop g4 is to bring this bishop back to g6, 
to go with the knight on e4 and bring it on c5. Why do I need my knight on uh, bishop on g6? Because once he plays queen c2 and I play bishop g6, I'll kick that queen away. And when I play knight c5, I'm going to attack the b3 pawn. So after like h3, I played bishop h5, queen e3, queen e7. Sorry, this is Kashishvili Nakamura, not my game. Rook 81, knight d7. This is how I played against uh, Jovanovic Dushin as well. Uh, knight h4, rook d8, knight f5, queen f8. Uh, almost the same like in the game Kashishvili against Nakamura. Kashishvili played g4, bishop g6, knight g3, and knight d4. Nakamura went for this move after bishop e7, knight c5. He had a very, very strong position because he managed to break the pawn structure of white. This was the game Kashishvili Nakamura World Open 2005. And I'll show you a game of mine because we go with rook e8. If I once again, or if somebody asks you, why do you play rook e8? Don't you think it's the same if you play rook e8 or if you just play queen e7? No, it's not the same. Once they play on e5, d5, you wouldn't be able to bring your knight back on e7. So after rook e8, castles e5, they just go with d5. Center is closed, and I'm showing you my game. I'm showing you my game from Championship of My City, where I actually won. And uh, this was the last round. Uh, my opponent is a very tough guy to crack because he plays a very solid chess. I played knight e7. But I was very confident during the game because I knew the plan. So I played bishop f5, played queen d7, and uh, brought my bishop on h3. After I played bishop h3, I was happy to exchange the bishop pair. Even though the game was uh, kind of closed and the bishop pair wasn't like fully activated. But the point was, I want to attack on the king side. My opponent played bishop h1, and I uh, decided to go into attack. He played e4, I played queen h5. I was threatening knight g4. He played f3 to stop that. I played queen g6. I'm now hoping for knight h5 to go after g3, but at the same time to break with f5. He played knight f1, I played knight h5. He played bishop g2, I captured. And I was very happy and confident when I played f5. Basically, in all these tango openings, we should be very happy when we break with f5. He played knight e2, I played rook f8. Uh, I decided to defend my pawn on a5 before I double up my rooks. He played queen c2 and I played rook f6. I decided to line up my rooks and the queen on the file and to triple up my pieces on the f5. I played queen f7, played rook g6, threatening knight f4 at some point, uh, played queen f6. And here, uh, this is one of those moments where you're clearly maneuvering and you just wait for your chance. And he immediately made a mistake playing king f2. Uh, he probably uh, thought about some variations with knight f4 check that looked annoying. And actually, I wanted to do that because queen on f6 um, with x-rays attacks this knight on c3. He played king f2 and immediately recognized the uh, point. I took, and now he can take my pawn. <coughs> when he captured, I played queen f7. Queen d3, I found a place for my knight. My opponent was very happy when he played bishop b2 because he thought he was holding everything. But now big Maya is coming, baby. Knight h4. So if he takes on, if he plays king g1, knight f3 wins. If he takes on h4, rook g2 check. And if king g2, knight f4 winning the queen. If king e3, just check mate on f4. He played king e2. And when I played knight g2, he couldn't stop losing an exchange and check on f4. And he resigned the game. So this was my last round of that tournament. Thanks to this game, I won in the tournament. And I was actually very, very happy with this one. Hope that you enjoyed this presentation of uh, Knight C3 and type of Nimzo uh, positions. And I actually hope even more you're going to have great successes with this variation. See you later. <laughs>